Hey y'all, this is Amanda and welcome back to my Texas Zone 8A garden and today I'm on the front porch. It's nice and chilly and I'm dreaming of my spring garden and so I wanted to tell you guys about my 10 must-have cut flowers for my garden. Okay, when I say must have, these are flowers that I've grown for years. They're tried and true. I'm happy with pretty much everything and they're fairly low maintenance, which is a key thing for me in my garden. Yes, I love some of the fussy flowers. I love the blooms and such, but these are 10 blooms that you can grow in your garden that are beautiful cut for cut flower arrangements and they need minimal assistance along the way. So we're at the end of fall. We're heading into winter. It's chilly outside. I am finally in long sleeves. Y'all know that I'm almost always in short sleeves all the time. Um, I'm sure there will be some December videos where I will be in short sleeves as well, just because that's how our weather goes in this area. And so, but today I thought I'd get out on the front porch and I wanted to start thinking and dreaming of my garden for next year and so as I'm dreaming I wanted to be able to give you guys these 10 flowers where if you are going to order anything these are the flowers I suggest trying to grow in your cut flower garden. Now there is a wide variety of flowers that I'm going to have on here. There's 10 different ones. I'm not going to go into super depth on each individual flower because this video would be an hour long but I do want to touch on some of the things I love about each one and I want to show you some of the arrangements of where I've utilized them in my cut flower arrangements. Okay, so let's start with number one, and that's going to be Celosia. All right, so the Celosia is a unique flower. It comes in a lot of different varieties. It comes in kind of a coxcomb variety where it almost looks like a brain. It comes in a feathery plume variety. It comes in short, it comes in tall, it comes in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. It also comes in a plethora of different colors, which is really, really fun because you can choose Celosia that really works for a color scheme that you're aiming for. Or if you're like me and you just want to grow all the colors, you can do that too, because that's certainly something I love about Celosia. Celosia is an inexpensive seed, and it's also a seed that you can gather from your flowers, which is kind of nice. So once you buy Celosia, you can basically kind of skip buying for years, as long as you're collecting the seeds. I do have a video on collecting Celosia seeds. It's super easy. The seeds are actually beautiful. They're teeny tiny, almost little black seed pebbles. They're absolutely beautiful. Celosia has a pretty strong stems. Um, it holds up to the heat in my particular area. It does well in drought. Sometimes it has issues with spider mites, so you might want to treat it for that. Um, it typically has the issues with the spider mites when it's really hot and dry for an extended amount of time. Celosia is also excellent for drying and a really fun dried um, bloom that you can do a lot of different things with. So if you want some really bold, unique blooms in your garden, Celosia is definitely the way to go for a cut flower. And a couple of varieties of Celosia that I may be growing this year are our Orange Queen Improved, Sunday Bright Pink, and Flamingo Feather. Number two is Larkspur. So Larkspur is kind of like an old timey kind of flower. Um, it's not as widely used, I think, today in modern gardens. It is definitely an English garden type of feel. It's in the Delphinium family, but on a smaller scale. It does reseed itself really well, which is wonderful. So once you can get some Larkspur going in your garden, as long as you allow the blooms to mature on the stems, it will reseed its, re itself in the same place. Larkspur doesn't come in a wide variety of colors, uh, mostly uh, deep purples, lavenders, whites, light pinks, dark pinks. That's pretty much it uh, where it comes. You can get it in some ivories, and I've seen some people say that they can grow light yellow, but I've never grown the light yellow color. Larkspur is also a line flower, meaning it has a long kind of shape, spear-like shape, which is really fun for floral arrangements, kind of create unique contrast. It's also a really great cut flower for drying. So you can just pop it upside down and allow it to dry out and then enjoy the blooms for months to come. It's inexpensive, it's easy to seed. I just posted a video on planting Larkspur. Um, I'm really excited where I've relocated my Larkspur. I'm excited to have it there and allow it to just to reseed every 
every year so that I don't have to worry about planting it again. And this year for Larkspur, I am growing a deep blue, light pink, and fancy smoky eyes. Okay, number three is giant marigolds. So this is a new one to my list and anybody who's been watching my series throughout the summer into the fall knows that I've recently been growing at giant mission marigolds in yellow. And in the past when I've grown marigolds, I've started them in the spring and I did do that with a different variety called Starfire. And I start them in the spring and then truthfully by the time we get to the summer, they're suffering from drought and spider mites and they're just not doing very well. So with the giant mission marigolds, I actually started them in July and August. August, started them from seeding and I started the seeds inside and then moved the seedlings outside and I had beautiful results. I am just in love with the giant mission marigolds in yellow so much so that I hope to also grow it in a let's see orange and then there's a white color that I would like to grow it in for next year. These were a surprise for me this year because I've never had very good results with marigold specifically with the spider mite so I was really excited I had no issues with these they look absolutely beautiful they smell very earthy which I actually really love that scent and they look absolutely beautiful in so many of my fall arrangements. Now I would love to have them earlier in the year but like I said I've probably tried four or five times starting them in the spring and trying to grow them into the summer without any luck whereas this one time that I started them in July and August I had amazing luck with that so I think that that's going to be my new approach for marigolds I think they're going to be a midsummer bloom that I get started and then I'm going to anticipate them for the fall you can also save seeds from marigolds so once you plant them as long as you have good results and you can collect the seeds and never have to buy seeds again and I did post a video on how to collect marigold seeds as well and a couple of the giant marigolds gold varieties that I have grown or intend to grow next year are the Giant Mission Yellow and the Giant Mission Orange. Number four on my list is Amaranthus. So I recently had a subscriber ask, is it Amaranthus or Amaranth? Well, in floral world, in florist world, and for those of you who don't know, I used to be a florist, we called it amaranthus. But amaranth is a grain, is the grain that you can collect from the flowers and you can make um, breads and things along those lines. So it is known as both. I call the flower amaranthus. If it's going to be a grain you're utilizing for a grain, I call it amaranth. Now, amaranthus doesn't come in a wide variety of colors. Um, a lot of burgundies, uh, terracottas, kind of biscuit tones, uh, those are all beautiful. It comes in greens, which is nice. I recently grew a new variety uh, that is, I think it was called Mira, Mira, Mira or Kira <laughs> from Floret. And it was more of a pink and green mix, which was very cool. Um, that comes, Amaranthus comes in spikes, but then it also comes in like drapes where it like drapes down really long tassels, which is very cool. It's a very unique, unusual flower, and it can be a little daunting to begin um, kind of designing with something like that because it's kind of like, what do I do with this bloom? It's not the typical round flower that I usually design with, but it goes a long way to add some texture. It's also an excellent cut flower for drying, and you can collect the seeds at the end of the season and utilize them each year to follow. So once you plant amaranthus, it does reseed itself really, really well. Um, once you plant it, you're probably going to have it for quite a while. A couple of my favorite uh, varieties of amaranthus are red spike, which has been tried and true for me over the years, and autumn touch. Number five on my list is cosmos. Now, Cosmos are a new favorite to me. I've grown them in the past and I've not been that happy with them. And I don't know why I didn't enjoy them before. I think that perhaps 
earlier on in my gardening career, I was much more rigid and I liked more formal-esque gardens. As I've continued growing throughout gardening, I have really learned to love and embrace the organic, soft, mixed cottage garden styling. And so I think originally when I grew Cosmos, it didn't work for my look. Now it works beautifully for my look and I love them. They're so whimsical. They look like butterflies kind of fluttering in the wind. Absolutely beautiful. Cosmos are cut and come again. The more you cut on them, the more they're going to produce blooms. Now I have never collected Cosmos seeds. I'm sure it can be done. It's just not something that I have tried out, but it is something you can look into. However, the seeds are fairly inexpensive, so it's nothing I really worry about. I will be starting Cosmos again earlier spring. This year I didn't start them until mid-summer, but I still got a beautiful flush of blooms for the autumn. When you're cutting and utilizing Cosmos, there are more flowers that sit above the arrangements. You don't pull them down really tight to the arrangements because they're so delicate. So they really are you know, made to sit on top and have movement and fluttering throughout the arrangement due to the Cosmos. Two varieties that I've been growing and have really enjoyed are Zenzia and White Cupcake. Number six on my cut flower must-haves is kind of a surprise in that it's not a traditional cut flower and that is sedum. Now I've had several people remark as I've posted pictures of my arrangements or videos of my arrangements of how they never really thought about utilizing sedum in floral arrangements. And I'm here to tell you it is a great flower to use for floral arrangements. Now you're gonna be looking for a sedum that's long stemmed. Uh, typically you're gonna be waiting until right now we've been harvesting a lot for the fall because they've been blooming and turning colors absolutely beautiful. But you can actually harvest sedum while the buds are still closed and it's all green and it looks fantastic in arrangements at that at that stage as well. Sedum is not something that I've collected seeds from. However, sedum can be divided and um, you know separated over time as a perennial, and so you can get multiple plants out of one plant over the years. Typically, if I'm going to utilize sedum in an arrangement, I like to cut it and I like to leave it sitting out for about six to eight hours to allow the end of it to kind of um, scab over, and that allows it keeps the sedum from getting too much water in the floral arrangement. And two varieties of sedum that I grow in my garden and that I love to for, utilize for arrangements are Autumn Joy and Autumn Fire. Lucky number seven on my list is sunflowers. Now, I really feel like sunflowers is a must have in a cut flower garden. They are so fun, so whimsical, so easy to grow, and they bring a lot of vibrance to arrangements. Sunflowers also grow during the hottest parts of the year for me over here in zone 8A, North Texas. And so sunflowers are <laughs> Activity top of the list because when everything else is baking and dying, sunflowers are really doing well. There's a wide variety of sunflowers to grow. You can grow a single stem where they're going to have one stem with one blue at the top, one bloom at the top, and you cut it and you're done. Or you can grow branching, which is really fun. So it's going to have a stem that's going to have multiple branches coming off of it over time. I actually love both, but I'm actually really partial to branching sunflowers because I like how whimsical and kind of Willy Wonka that they are within my garden. The main single stem or single bloom sunflower that you probably heart, heard of are pro cuts and I have grown a wide variety of pro cuts. I have found that if you plant them too close together you get really small sunflowers which might be something that you want so it's something to consider. If you space them out by at least eight inches you're going to get a larger bloom head. Pro cuts are also pollenless, which is really nice because um, if you don't have pollen, then you don't have it like dripping all over your table and making a big old mess. And so pro cuts are what's generally utilized by florists or in the flower farm world. But sunflower pollen doesn't really bother me, but I also don't own fine furniture, y'all. I, you know, I have three children, two dogs. There's a lot living in this little bitty house. And so while our furniture is, you know, beautiful and loved, it does take a beating. So a little bit of pollen is not going to be the end of the world for me. 
Okay, the Pro Cut Sunflowers, um, if you collect seeds from those, those are not gonna produce the same thing again. Um, they're created to do that. So if you collect the seeds from a Pro Cut Sunflower, you're gonna get a branching sunflower after. So that's important. But most sunflowers, you can collect the seeds and reutilize them the next year and get a pretty, you know, true to original sunflower from what the original parent plant was. So hands down, one of my favorite ProCut uh, sunflowers to grow is called ProCut Gold Light. And I grew that this year and it is the most beautiful, perfect, gorgeous sunflower. It's yellow in the center and yellow petals, absolutely gorgeous. I also love to grow the Autumn Beauty Mix. Uh, it is a mix of sunflowers that's by Botanical Interests, but you can also find similar mixes at big box stores in the seed packets. And it's one of my favorites. It's a mix of browns and reds reds and yellows and just absolutely gorgeous autumn tones. Number eight on my must-have cut flower list is Gumfrina. Now, if you had asked me two years ago if Gumfrina would be on my must-have cut flower list, I would have said heck no, because <laughs> I disliked it so much. It is not a traditional flower. It grows kind of wonky. Um, it's unique. It feels kind of papery like a straw flower. It's a pretty cool bloom, but it's definitely something that's a little bit different. It doesn't come in a wide variety of colors. It comes in your traditional whites, pinks, purples, and some kind of red, reddish orange tones as well. Gonfrina does reseed itself in my garden, and I kind of like that this last year. Once I notice a seedling coming up at any point in place in the garden because it did reseed itself like 50 feet away. <laughs> I would just go dig up that seedling and move it to wherever I wanted it throughout my cut flower garden. Gonfrina is a trooper in the drought and hot heat of the summer. It's going to give you bright, brilliant tones when things are at their hottest. Gonfrina also makes for a really exceptional cut flower. Now, one of the things I don't love about Gonfrina is it's not gonna give you a straight stem. It's gonna give you a straight stem with additional stems coming off at a 45, not a 45, yeah, 45 degree angle from the baseline of that. So it's gonna come off at a weird place. So a lot of times when you cut the stems, you've got a straight stem and then you got flowers coming off at an angle over here. So it can be a little bit difficult to work with. You just need to plan ahead. I did do a really fun arrangement with Gonfrina this year where I just created this nice tight ball of Gonfrina and it's super fun and I allowed it to dry and it's still gorgeous even at this point. The most tried and true variety of Gonfrina that I've grown is Purple Globe. It does reseed itself really well. This next year I'm also going to be adding in a raspberry cream to the mix. Number nine on my must-have cut flower list is Scabiosa. Now, Scabiosa is a hardy annual that you can get started in the fall, plant it in the fall, and it will overwinter and give you very early spring blooms. Scabiosa grows like a very large plant, not single stems. So one plant can give you 50 blooms if you're really taking care of it. Scabiosa are small, they're delicate, they're very whimsical. I think they're such a fun bloom. Um, they will reseed themselves sometimes in my garden, but not as vigorously as some other blooms. I think scabiosas almost have like a snowflake type effect to them, the way and the way they're shaped and how delicate everything is. There's a lot of detail within a scabiosa. Scabiosas also look really good once they've allowed all their petals to fall off. They kind of just create this kind of unique little, you know, seed pod ball thing, which is really kind of fun and interesting to add to arrangements. Some of my favorite scabiosa varieties are Fire King. Snow Maiden, and Fata Morgana. And number 10 on my must-have cut flower list, I'm sure you're not surprised, but it is Zinnias. So, if I could only have one cut flower for my garden, it would be Zinnias, hands down. Zinnias give me a lot of joy. They're easy to grow. They do beautifully in the hot weather and droughts. They are pretty disease resistant. I typically only have a little bit of powdery mildew issues at the very end of the fall season. 
and they just give such gloriously beautiful balloons. Zinnias come in a wide variety of sizes. Um, you can get really short ones, petite ones that are almost like carpet-like zinnias. You can also get really, really tall ones. I've grown them up to six feet, which is fun. They are cut and come again. There's a... <laughs> bug there. They are cut and come again balloons in that the more you cut on them, the more balloons they're going to produce for you. You can also collect zinnia seeds from a dried zinnia head, which is really fun because that means once you've bought them, you don't have to buy them again. Zinnias are hands down one of the easiest blooms to grow. So if you are a beginner gardener, this is something that I would absolutely suggest you put at the top of your list. However, if you're an experienced gardener and it's been a rough year like it has here in Texas Zone 8A, I highly suggest putting zinnias at the top of your list so you can have some immediate success next season. So my favorite zinnias are Purple Prince Zinnia, which is my tried and true, and it reseeds itself every year. I also love Polar Bear Zinnias, and I'm a huge fan of the Queen Lime series, whether it's Queen Lime Blush, Orange, Red, whatever. It's a really fun series to grow, and one plant will give you seven or eight different color tones. All right, you guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video going over the top 10 must have cut flowers for your cut flower garden. Like I said, these aren't just things I think are pretty. These are cut flowers that do really, really well with extreme temperatures like what I have here in Texas zone 8A. They're easy to grow, meaning they don't need tons and tons of maintenance and you know, you don't have to baby these plants, which is really, really <laughs> nice, you know. They also do excellent in cut flower arrangements in that they they have a long base life. They're tried and true hardy blooms. All right, y'all hope you enjoyed today's video. As always, she's a mad gardener or decorator or anything else that she wants to be. Thanks, y'all.